Good morning. This is Ellen Horseman with the Camden, Arkansas First United Methodist Church. And welcome to Sundays with Ellen. Almost forgot my name there for a minute, didn't I? But don't tell anybody. I've been looking at a book and talking with you about a book by a Reverend Scott Sauls called A Gentle Answer and subtitled Our Secret Weapon in an Age of Us Against Them. The first part of the book, he talks about the gentleness that Jesus has for us. Now we're going into the second part of the book, which is how Jesus's gentleness changes us. And this very uh, first chapter in this section, but chapter four in the book, is, is entitled, We Grow a Thicker Skin. We grow a thicker skin. Well, my first question is, what? Are we thin-skinned? How do we respond, friends? How do you respond if you are criticized, especially if you're criticized at church by a, another church member, or you're criticized when you're doing something or you're opposed when you're doing something that you think is God's work, that you think is the right thing to do? Uh, do you get angry? How many times have you left a group of people or left a Bible study or left a Sunday school class or maybe even left a church altogether or maybe left church altogether because somebody uh, upset you, somebody angered you, somebody made you feel persecuted. That may be a strong word, but you felt persecuted. Uh, how do we respond when someone insults us, uh, when someone falsely accuses us? Do we return insult for insult and injury for injury and hopefully not false accusation for false accusation, but how do we respond? It's not easy to be criticized and it's especially not easy to be criticized when we are doing church work or we are doing what we believe is God's work. And yet Jesus tells us, hey, well, I'm not sure he says hey, but sounds good. Jesus tells us to be happy when we are persecuted. I'm going to read you two translations of Matthew chapter 5 in the section that we normally call the Beatitudes when Jesus talks about being persecuted. So listen to this first from the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, I guess it would help if I got my glasses. Excuse me just a minute. That's a little better. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are you. We've heard those beatitudes like that, but the word blessed as it is used here would probably more properly be, be uh, translated happy. And still, look, what is he saying? Be blessed, be happy when people persecute you or utter false accusations against you. Really? Listen to this. Uh, I think it feels even stronger in this translation from the Common English Bible. So I'm going to read the same verse to you now from the CEB. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harassed the prophets who came before you. So be happy, says Jesus. Expect persecution, is what Jesus tells us. Expect persecution. But I want to be clear. Persecution is, it's not just being picked on. It's not just being made fun of or insulted or injured. Because we could be and are often harassed and insulted and persecuted and berated and all kinds of things uh, just in general in the world. I'm sorry, but this is a, <laughs> to use a cliche, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Uh, it is definitely a place where we have that us-against-them mentality that unfortunately, unfortunately we partake of too. But we're talking about being harassed, persecution for Jesus is being harassed when you are doing what Jesus has called you to do. Uh, when you are being loyal to Jesus's truth and grace and love, that's persecution. It's not the same as being disliked. 
it, it's certainly not the same. I want to be clear about this. Just because you're doing church work and get get picked on, or what you call church work, or just because you're doing what you think is right, uh, and then you get picked on at church or people don't agree with you, that's not necessarily persecution. Unfortunately, sometimes we get an idea of how something should be done, uh, something especially should be done at church, and so sometimes we get that idea before we've really prayed about it. We get the idea, and then we ask God to bless that idea. So we have to be really careful to be certain that when we are doing God's work, when we are working for the Lord, that we are doing what God wants and what God requires. And I will go back to a filter that I've mentioned before, uh, and that is what Jesus says is the greatest commandment. What I am doing, the work I am doing, is it fulfilling the great commandment? Is it helping me or helping us to love God with all our hearts and soul and strength and mind and loving other people as I love myself? If it doesn't pass through that filter, then we maybe need to take another look. Uh, to kind of paraphrase what a Christian writer said one time, we can be pretty sure that we are trying to remake God, and I will say, and God's work in our own image if we decide that everything should be the way that I think it should be, or if we decide that God hates all the same people we do and is mad at all the same people we are. Oops. So to be clear, though, when you are doing God's work, you not only might be persecuted or harassed, we don't get persecuted as much if you think of persecution as physical persecution, but we certainly get harassed and falsely accused. I'm going to tell you, not only might you be falsely accused or harassed or criticized if you're doing God's work, you will be. You will be. And the number one people that will probably be doing that will be fellow church members. You see, we all say that we love God. We all want things to be a certain way, but we have a tendency to try to put people in the little categories we want them in. A person who is truly seeking God's love and justice will often be, you know, the people that are sort of on the left or more liberal side, even in Christianity, will, you know, look down on that person and then sometimes people on the right. I have occasionally heard a pastor criticized by people on sort of both both persuasions, very conservative Christians, very liberal Christians. I'm talking about in your Christianity now, not necessarily in your politics, although that also could apply. I've heard him criticize that pastor when that pastor is doing something or saying something, thinking that they're all the other way. And, and guess what? They... The other side is doing the same thing. So you're going to be harassed and you're going to be persecuted if you are following Christ. That's just something that we have to expect. And, you know, we flinch at our trials and we flinch when we're criticized and, and we want to give up. I know I have wanted to give up. And, well, if the truth be told, I probably have given up a few times in the past, of course. Uh, I have got, grown angry and returned insult for insult in the past, of course. Of course. But, you know, I've done that. I'm human, just like you are. And we flinch at our trials. When, when, when you come to think of it, we don't actually have to put up with the kind of persecution that people put up with in other countries. The pastor, Reverend Sauls, shares some statistics in his book. Let me grab my glasses again, and I'm going to read those to you. Today, every month, so every single month, Christians in more than 60 countries experience persecution. 322 Christians are killed on average every month. 214 churches or church properties are destroyed. 722 uh, Christians become victims of acts of violence like rape or beating or false arrest every day. In our country, we don't have that problem. We may be criticized, we might be misunderstood, but we have it relatively easy. So I'm going to read you something that Reverend Scott Saul says because I like the way he worded it. As our brothers and sisters across the globe expect and experience violence, oppression, and death, we in the West 
get our feelings hurt, withdraw from people relationally, and even become hostile when someone mildly criticizes us for our faith. We can be thankful for the religious freedoms that we enjoy and for the relative, relatively safe world in which we live. However, the contrast between the depths of life-threatening persecution and the shallows of social media criticism should provide us with a needed biblical perspective. Truth be told, we have it relatively easy in the West, which means that we should not become as easily offended as we often do. Just think how differently we would react to people's criticism and harassment if we think about what he's saying here. We have it really easy, rather mild, and so we shouldn't get so easily offended. Instead, we need to learn to put things in perspective. We do get offended, and as, as I was reading this, I just thought, oh, phooey, I forgot that I was going to start off early in this lesson by reading to you from 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, this is a familiar story of Elijah. Elijah was God's prophet, and Elijah had been directed by God to go and confront the priests of the uh, false god Baal. And so he has this big deal uh, meeting them up on Mount Carmel, I think it is. And they try to call down fire on their sacrifice. It doesn't work. And then, of course, Elijah does. And then the, the prophets of Baal are put to the sword, as they put it, that nice euphemistic way of saying killed off. And then King Ahab goes to his wife Jezebel and tells her what Elijah has done. So I'm going to read from chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all of Baal's prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah with this message, May the gods do whatever they want to me, if by this time tomorrow I haven't made your life like the life of one of them. Elijah was terrified. He got up and ran for his life. Now Elijah might be forgiven if for feeling uh, bad, Elijah might be forgiven if he felt like, hey, this is unfair. I did what God told me to do, and now this woman is who has power is threatening to kill me. And so he takes off, and he keeps going for several days till he gets to Mount Horeb, and he goes and he hides in a cave. And God comes to him in the cave, and he says, uh, let's see if I can find verse why are you here, Elijah? And in verse 10, Elijah replies, Look, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites had abandoned your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've murdered your prophets with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they want to take my life too. So Elijah feels like God has totally abandoned him. And that's the way a person can feel sometimes, being persecuted. Now, as I was saying, we can put things into perspective. We don't have people trying to take our lives. We do have people criticizing us, and hey, that's not very much fun. But we don't have people trying to take our lives. But sometimes we feel like Elijah, like, you know, gosh, Lord, I've been doing all this stuff you asked me to do, and here I am, the only one left. And I'll get back in a minute to how God responds to that. But let me now that I've segued back and jumped over and did what I was going to do in the beginning, let me jump back to the middle of my outline and say that one of the things that we can do, should do, as Christians who live in a culture where we will be criticized, but where we will not be put to death or violently assaulted, as some of our Christian brothers and sisters that I've read you the statistics for earlier, one of the things that we should see is that calls us to be people who call for justice. We should become champions of social justice everywhere. We should speak up for those who are persecuted. We should defend the weak and the persecuted. And I will say, even in our own country, we do see instances where there is not justice for certain groups of people. And this isn't a political stand. This isn't getting with a political party. This is being a Christian. It is our obligation as God's beloved children to stand up for and to speak truth to power 
for those who are being unjustly treated. As, uh, let's see, what was his name? Oh, oh gosh, never mind. As a great civil rights person whose, mind, whose name just went running out of my mind, because I'm old and I forget things, but as he said, when you see something, say something. Speak up for social justice. Speak up for those who are being persecuted. Do not be silent. Because a gentle answer doesn't mean that you don't confront injustice. And that's one of the things that we can take away from this lesson on persecution. Uh, let me see. Uh, as, again, I want to refer to Reverend Scott Sauls. He is such a good writer. I know I'm always almost peddling these books that I use for Sunday school class, but he has a wonderful way with words, so I'm going to let him have his way right here. He says, whenever and wherever there is persecution, opposition, or unjust treatment of vulnerable persons, Christians are called by God to serve as the conscience of society by speaking truth to power. Perhaps in this land of the free and home of the brave, this ought to be the Christian's primary way to follow Jesus in a world where others routinely suffer for their faith. So friends, we ought not to be indifferent. We ought not to just seek our own comfort and kind of ignore uh, others, but we should be willing to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. That's what he asked us to do. If we're following Jesus, as I've said earlier, we will be criticized. We will be opposed from time to time. But Jesus said we should rejoice in, per in our persecution. Happy are those who are persecuted or falsely accused for my sake, he says. Remember, it's for his sake, not just because. But wait a minute. How are we going to be happy in being persecuted? How is it possible for us to accept, again, we're not being physically persecuted, but we are persecuted by being attacked, um, criticized, uh, falsely accused. Boy, I hate that falsely accused part. That really gets me. I mean, <laughs> I can get in enough trouble with the things, you know, for people criticizing me for what I really do. I hate it when they're going to criticize me criticize me for something I didn't actually do or say. Uh, you know, not long ago, I got stopped by a cop for speeding. You know, I, I wasn't happy about it, but it's not like I was being falsely accused. Now, does that have anything to do with this Sunday school lesson? Ellen, I'm telling you, you need to be criticized for not staying on the subject. Okay, so how do we go about then uh, becoming happy about being persecuted. Well, I'm going to tell you one of the things that we do is we can rejoice. This is what Paul says. We can rejoice when we suffer because we know that we are participating in the suffering of Jesus. That's what Paul calls it, participating in, or I think another translation, we, he says, we are sharing in his suffering. That's in Philippians. Makes me think about uh, somewhere around the fifth chapter, fourth or fifth chapter of the book of Acts. Peter and John have been arrested. They're kept overnight. They're in danger of losing their life, but eventually they're let out of prison. And then, the, and then Luke says they rejoiced because they were found worthy to suffer for the Lord. Rejoiced because they were found worthy to be to suffer for God. Isn't that a refreshing way to look at it? Instead of feeling sorry for ourselves or sort of taking our marbles and going home or deciding, well, I'm not going to do any more for God or I'm not going to do any more for the church because people just criticize you whenever you do. Uh, instead, we can realize that we're sharing in the suffering of Jesus Christ. And by the way, Jesus tells us the other thing that kind of uplift us and help us deal with persecution of any type is to remember, he says, great will be your reward. That's what he says in that beatitude that I read to you earlier. So great will be your reward. Or as Paul puts it in Romans, let me read it to you as he say, stated it. I believe that the present suffering is nothing 
compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. So we can endure persecution and we can learn to take criticism and false accusations. And I'll tell you another reason why. Because we can come to know that we are not alone. It's not just that we're sharing in the suffering of Jesus, but we are not alone. We might feel like we're alone. Remember what Elijah told God? I've been, I've been zealous for the Lord. I, I've worked hard for God. I've worked hard for you, and I am all alone now. That's what he told God when God asked him, hey, why are you here? And so here's what God does for him, and you'll know that story. God said, I want you to go out to the mountain and watch because the Lord is going to pass by. And there comes a mighty, mighty wind. But the writer says, God was not, the Lord was not in the wind. And there's an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Uh, and there's a fire. But the Lord is not in the fire. And finally, Elijah hears what the writer calls the sound of sheer silence. And now a gentle voice calls to Elijah again because God was in the quiet voice, the sheer silence as the writer calls it. And the quiet voice calls to Elijah once again and says, why are you here, Elijah? And once again, Elijah says, well, you know, I've been, been working for you, God, and now I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. Still has the same complaint. But now he's heard God's quiet voice. And God says to him, Elijah, go on out of here. And essentially gives him some more work to do. And Elijah goes. And he does that work as he's ordained to do by God. Why? Because Elijah knows when he hears that quiet voice, that sheer silence, that God is with him. That he might feel alone and he might feel frustrated in his trials and he might be in danger of losing his life, but he is not alone. The God who created the heavens and the earth is with him. And God is with you. God is with you when you're feeling low. God is with you when you are being criticized. God is with you when you are being falsely accused. God is with you when you are being opposed. God is with you when you are persecuted. You are not alone. God is there. The quiet voice is always there. And so, as Christians, we can grow thicker skin because we know that we are not alone and because we realize that God is with us. Think of this. The God who created the heavens and the earth walks with you. The God who created the heavens and the earth came in human flesh and poured himself out in self-sacrifice on a tree for you. And so, as the writer of the epistle of John says, we love because he first loved us. Yes, we can withstand persecution and accusations and criticism. We can grow thicker skin. Because the gentle Jesus loves us. Because the gentle Jesus has given himself for us. And so, friends, how do we react to insult and injury and attacks? Can we learn to give the gentle answer? Because if we Christians don't turn and give a gentle answer, who will do it? Can we be the ones who offer grace because if we do not do that, who will do it? Can, be, can we be the ones who humble ourselves and become less testy and less easily offended and more willing to reach out a hand of love and patience towards those who have offended us? For if we Christians do not do it, who will? Friends, God loves you. God never leaves you alone. God has poured out his life and love for you. God and Jesus, his son, have been gentle with you. Let us be gentle with other people. Grow thicker skin. And may God keep you close and give you that thick skin 
and help you be better able to endure everything that comes your way. Amen, and bye-bye.